Right. Welcome back after lunch. Um, seems to be more and more lingering here as time goes by, uh, but that's okay. Um, as you can all see, I've dressed up to match Aaron's slides from yesterday. I don't know what he's going to do today, but he's going to talk to us about how he's used APL in teaching because that's obviously part of being an academic that you want to teach what you learned yourself. So, Aaron, I'm... Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I learned that I can actually walk on, on the plush carpet instead of being up on this uh, high horse podium here. So, you know, teaching has an element of humility to it, so, I, you know, we can come down to the masses. And uh, the, I'm, I'm going to have to apologize ahead of time. This is a, not going to be as polished a talk as the other one. And unfortunately, the biggest change you'll notice is there are no feline influences in the slides. Uh, I apologize for that. But the, the title of this talk is not really clever at all. There's no joke or funniness about this because in every way, almost, this, this title says it all. It really was a very daring expedition that we did. I felt like I was, you know, marching into some unknown space territory, trying to find my way around and avoid all sorts of obstacles while being attacked from both sides in all, uh, in all manners. And, uh, Morton said the other day that my compiler's research was pretty left field. And if that is left field, I'm, I'm way out in the food stands uh, here. It's, 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 this, is, this is extremely experimental work. Uh, and, and, and so the first slide is a warning, and a big warning, that this is all very, very preliminary. I, I haven't even done the actual analysis of the data we collected on this research. Um, yet. So most of this is going to be anecdotal evidence on, on various things and just the way we set this up and the overall impressions that we had from our uh, post-mortems and, uh, and, and, and the like. So, oh dear. Well, that's ugly. Oh well. Okay, moving on. <laughs> uh, that's supposed to be a W there. What we started this was really what happens what happens when you decide you're going to teach high schoolers about computer science? You've been given a blank slate by people who don't know any better. And so then we decided, well, let's do them, let's let them do whatever they want. Let's only teach them how to parallel program, not teach them anything about regular programming. And let's make sure it's purely functional. And Let's use none other than, than defunds and APL to do it. And, and you'll notice Fiona got to me. Uh, uh, she she, she uh, very politely uh, mentioned in, in passing that, that my co-defund slide used a capital D in my terminology. So I have, I have bowed to the, to, the, uh, to the documentation queen, and we now have a lowercase d here. So. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm now in sync. So, this, this, this is a lot of what it felt like to do this course. I, uh, we had decided to do this, we had come up, we'd done a lot of research, a lot of work on, on, on tr how to teach. Uh, my, my minor in my uh, coursework at the university is in human-computer interaction with a strong emphasis on the learning sciences. So I had, gone to the classes, I had studied the texts, I had done all this, I came up with my th learning educational frameworks, I was all set, and then it was like the Borg attacked. Uh, and I just, and they were, they were really, uh, I, was, I was fighting a lone battle out there. And, and really we started fighting a battle from the first acronym. Uh, because the FSM program is, uh, stands for Foundations in Science and Mathematics. And that's a summer program started by graduate students at IU to uh, prepare uh, students in high school or middle school for coursework in their, their future uh, high school courses. And unfortunately, it's a very poorly chosen acronym because nobody ever guessed that that's what it stood for. Every time I started talking about this, uh, first they would say Flying Spaghetti Monster, and then they would say Finite State Machine. And then only after that did I explain to them that we're actually talking about foundations in science and mathematics. And this, this program is designed to create uh, opportunities for self-selected 
high schoolers to get an edge in, in their coursework. But in IU or in Indiana, especially in the Bloomington area, uh, we hate the AP computer science courses. They're abysmal. And because they're abysmal, perhaps in a rare uh, insight, the schools don't really teach it. And so the, uh, we didn't have a curriculum to base our curriculum on. We didn't have a target that we were aiming for at the high school level. So we were given a completely blank slate, ground up envisioning, uh, really re-envisioning of what we wanted to do for computer science education, and how we were going to make this happen. And, and it's me. I got a hold of this. I became lead on the project. So of course, things got a little out of control. And I decided, why should we just stick to teaching people about traditional computer science? Let's, let's make this not only uh, an, an outreach program, a uh, attempt to draw people into the colleges, let's also make this an HCI study about syntax and semantics and the effects it has on interactions of students and learning. And then let's also ask this deep philosophical question about whether the brain is cognitively more suited to doing serial or parallel programming. Why not do it all at once? <laughs> Should be fun. And because I've been doing APL, and APL has in part inspired some of these thoughts, I decided let's, let's use defunds to do this. And for those of you who don't know, I'm pretty much the only active APLer in my <laughs> university. And I couldn't do this alone, so I had to go and rope in some people and convince them that they could not only learn APL, but that they could teach somebody else how to write APL, having just learned it themselves. So this was almost like a, a multi-level educational program where I was teaching the teachers how to teach to high schoolers with APL. So it was, it was fun. It was a lot, of, a lot of good. And one of the questions that we uh, got, men, got money to ask, basically, <laughs> this is how we got funded, was to funnel new talent into the university systems, and in particularly, strongly emphasized uh, addressing the uh, gender imbalances and the gender biases in, in the uh, American computing sectors and universities and that sort of thing. And so we decided to put a particular emphasis on that and we had to pick a target. We had to pick sort of a forward-looking where do we want them to go eventually thing. And so we chose uh, Indiana University's entry-level computer science course, which is based on the scheme programming language and emphasizes recursive functional programming practices and things that a lot of APLers are familiar with, like reductions and maps and folds and these, uh, these other sorts of things. Um, so, like I said, I couldn't do this alone. It was pretty much impossible. So I, I roped in a few people, unsuspecting, innocent, young, uh, impressionable graduate and undergraduates. Jason Heeman was really my, my sort of uh, second in command, and he, he really dove into this. Uh, he's a, uh, a graduate student that's sort of apprenticed to the Friedman uh, craftsmanship of, of programming. And Jenny Lipson is, was an uh, undergraduate instructor. At IU, we have this undergraduate instructor program, and she had taught the entry-level computer science courses at IU. And so she, she uh, happily uh, and rather unknowingly volunteered for this program. To, to get some stuff done. And then uh, Anna Eilering was, uh, she didn't actually do any of the teaching or any of that, but she was uh, instrumental in sort of moving the program forward early on and doing a lot of the external extracurricular activities. So the first question we encountered, what do you do with enrollment? How do we sign people up? And this is actually a bit more of a problem than you might think. So we, one of the, big things that we had is we, 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 the program is traditionally just self-selected people signing up for the courses they want to take. But in traditional programs like this, there's a heavy selection bias that goes into people getting into the program, and that doesn't really do well for us if we're trying to understand how people learn or understand how people are able to learn things like APL or parallel programming if we have a, a really heavy selection bias. So what we did is we changed it and said, you will learn computer science. So the courses, we had a huge number of computer science courses and made it mandatory for everybody to take a computer science course. Now, technically, we can't force anybody to learn computer science. So rather than calling it mandatory, we 
opted everybody in automatically, and then allowed them to self-select out of the program if that's what they wanted to do. And in addition to that, we didn't charge any money to add this course on. It was a free additional module to the other courses in the FSM program that they were taking. So there was no monetary barrier to taking the course, and there was, you had to actively not want to do computer science in order to not be in the program. And we were hoping that this would actually help to address some of the gender selection bias issues and some of that. And, and then we had to start talking about how we're going to teach. What are we going to teach them and how are we going to teach them this thing? So I only got a minor in the learning sciences. So <laughs> my, uh, I, I attempted to very clumsily and sloppily apply the educational frameworks that I had learned about in my coursework and from reading about computer science education elsewhere into the system, which the two a few of the buzzwords are situated learning and constructivism. And they come from two different schools of thought in education, the, uh, learning science theory. Uh, forgive me, anybody who actually understands this stuff better than I, I'm really butchering it. But uh, the idea basically is that we want to make things relevant to the students, which is a sort of a common sense thing, but we want to do that in a way that actively encourages the learning of the topics that we care about. And to do that in a way that um, gives them practicable, uh, real skill sets in addition to worrying about whether or not they've got the big abstract ideas. So we, we, we tried to put this in, and one of the biggest changes in the way we taught compared to the traditional ones, there was basically no lecture. Uh, there was almost no lecture to the program. We didn't really talk to them at all about how to program. And we also had no linear curriculum. So there was no syllabus of things that you're going to go through. And at this point, people are going to usually think, well, then what did you do? <laughs> you know, because in most programs, that's all you do. You've got a syllabus, you teach, you lecture on it, and then you work on homework, or you work on one of these other programs. That's what the students expected. That's what our faculty supervisors expected. That's what the parents expected. That's what everybody expected. And we decided to throw it all out. So we were going from eighth grade up to 12th grade. So we had some people, I think, as young as maybe... 12, 11, that range uh, up to uh, probably 17, 18. I, didn't really, I, I haven't done any analysis, so I don't know the actual ranges of their ages. Um, but we did have a fairly wide spectrum of high schoolish, junior high, high school type uh, people working here. So we decided we, did need, we needed some structure. We couldn't just throw them in and say, let's write some code. Um, you know, that, that probably wouldn't work. So we decided to come up with a little bit of structure. And we already had some structure imposed on us. The, we had two weeks to do this course. And we had three days out of each of those weeks, separated by a day, uh, two to three hours per class. So basically there were three classes, each of them two to three hours long, three classes a day for three days a week for two weeks. And that was the main structure that was enforced on us. And then we created basically two different sets of documents. The first set of documents are the domains. And what these domains are is they're a set of problems, uh, real world problems, not t dumbed down or toned down in any way. They're, they're real world problems in these particular areas of study that people want answers to. Um, now, they might not be particularly sophisticated ones, but they're at least real at, at some level, things that people actually do or play with at some level. And so each of these domains had a set of problems to solve that covered the same basic semantic ideas, the same techniques. The, in order to solve them with uh, nothing but parallel pure functional defunds, you, you used basically the same approaches and techniques across the board with these problems. So they were relatively interchangeable. If you did one and you did the other, you would probably learn some of the same things regardless. And then we put on the other side a set of reference materials or documents and guides for them to work with in addition to that. So we sort of recommended that they read Mastering Dialog APL. I think maybe negative one of them actually read it. Um, <laughs> well, I, I only wanted them to read like the first 20 pages, but apparently um, I had forgotten how little high schoolers like to read. <laughs> Um, so that, scratch that, but we did create a set of custom guides which had explanations of everything, all the techniques that they were going to need to use in 
more traditional prose of how, of how to solve various problems. But these guides never actually gave solutions to any problems, just the abstract techniques for solving these problems. So they would you know, give you what is an operator, how does it work, what is a function, how does that work. And we specifically chose the language to be emphasizing declarative programming. So rather than saying you rotate a matrix, you would say something like uh, this, uh, you know, this expression De, uh, defines or describes uh, a matrix that is the same as the other matrix, except with all these, uh, except that the rows are rotated or something like that. We attempted to use language that didn't suggest any operational behavior, or we tried to as much as possible. And then, in addition to that, we set them up on Linux Red Hat Enterprise machines in our computer science labs, with no additional computing aids at all. They got the full APL environment sitting there at the terminals with the keyboards. The only aid that we gave them was a paper sheet with the keyboard symbols on it. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I caved, I caved. I'm, I, I should have been the more hardcore teacher, but I gave them a cheat sheet. So then we had a few principles of how the course was going to, pro what they were going to do in the course, which was basically do whatever you like. Do whatever you want to do. We don't really care. Go. Do stuff, be free. Um, and then the main restriction on that was, well, go be free and do some real problems. Work on something real at some level. And we didn't actually require them to pick any of the domains that we had written. If they wanted to work on a different problem, they were free to work on any other problem they wanted to. Um, what we did do is provide a little assistance and sort of over-the-shoulder guidance on how they might break the problem down, how they might approach it. Uh, et cetera, but fundamentally, we encouraged them to pick a domain and then work through all the problems in whatever order they wanted, however they felt, skip over a problem if you don't want it or you don't like it, who cares? But basically, they would, most of the students did follow that pattern. They took one of the domains, like good little sheep, and went and worked on the problems. Uh, but some of them actually did find the freedom uh, at least exploitable and used it uh, in one fashion or another. And, and then the final idea behind what they were going to do is just do some code. Just we want you to code, but we want you to code socially. So one of the ideas is we weren't just trying to teach them APL. And in fact, APL was almost incidental to what we wanted them to know. Rather, we wanted them to get used to what does it feel like to be a computer scientist? What does it feel like to practice these sets of things? And in that realm, you're dealing with problems you might not understand. You're dealing with code you might not understand. You're dealing with other people and having to work with other people and other personalities that you may or may not like. Um, you're, you're, basically, there's a whole lot of things. You're, you're dealing with reference manuals that don't give you the answers to your homework problems. Um, all of these things. So we tried to make it as realistic an experience as possible to give them an accurate or authentic uh, environment in which to practice these things, all with the safety net of, some of the scaffolding, which is us and a little bit of extra tooling to give them some hints and, and, and uh, help them along whenever they uh, might have become discouraged. So the, um, the three big things we were emphasizing, declarative, functional, and parallel. We really tried to emphasize these thought patterns in, in their work. So whenever they started thinking uh, iteratively, uh, which is a trick question because they actually never thought iteratively. <laughs> uh, but Basically, they, whenever they would do things, we would encourage an aesthetic that emphasized these approaches in the terms of how we described problems, how we gave answers, etc. And actually, the teachers had more pro trouble with this than the students did. Uh, Jason and Jenny were always, you know, looking up, trying, was that the right vocabulary to use? You know, was this what I was supposed to be doing? Uh, and and it was, it was a, it was. It was obvious who had already had programming experience and who had not. Um, and some of the high schoolers had actually had done programming before in C, C++, Python, JavaScript, some, uh, uh, some called HTML programming. But uh, they, some had it, and some had no experience at all. So as far as results go, we don't have a lot right now. But one of the things that we did succeed at was we did manage to have above average minority enrollments. Um, both in terms of uh, gender and race, which I don't know how much you guys care about that. It's a rather big deal at IU, so um, it's, it's a, a thing. And, and in 
talking with some of the students, the enrollment process that we used actively contributed to this. Um, so a number of students said, well, the course was free, why not take it? And a number of other students said, well, you know, I figured it'd be a good idea to do it, I saw it on the list. So there was no, they never, they weren't really particularly geared to doing it, they weren't really pumped up when they first came in, but they had come in anyway because we had reduced the barrier far enough that they would have had to have exerted more effort than they wanted to to get out of the course than to stay in it. Um, you know, so leverage that apathy. So, what were we worried about? Symbols, symbols, symbols. What are they going to do with these symbols? We've got Greek, we've got pictorials. Um, you know, what are we going to do here? They're in a, a Linux environment, which we actually intended them to be on a Windows environment with the little GUI bar and everything, but due to the fact that the IT department couldn't get Windows software installed in time and tell us about it, we had to do our own installation on Linux environments, which left us with very little coddling in terms of the environment. And we were very worried about this, at least I was, um, and whether this was going to be a problem. And we were worried that when they got to these domains, that they wouldn't actually go through them, that they would be sort of bored, they'd just goof off, they wouldn't actually progress through, because it was very little structure in the program. And traditionally, without structure, you might have a lot of wild kids, potentially. And then again, symbols, symbols and symbols, and more symbols. You know, we, were, we were all prepared to deal with the symbol issue. Um, but, lo and behold, the one problem we did not have was with the symbols. And I mean this like, literally, we, we, no student ever had a problem typing in a symbol, complained about a symbol, had a trouble identifying symbols at any level or degree. We could find zero tangible evidence that symbols caused any trouble at all, anecdotally. There was absolutely zero barrier there. <laughs> and even not having a, a, a GUI keyboard to type in, they picked up how to have an extra shift key and type a character instantly. It was zero problem there. And, and reading the, some of them were a little slow at typing, but that's okay, because uh, they were slow typists anyway. And it's, it's acceptable when you only have to type one character <laughs> to get the thing to work. But we had, I, I actually, this is one of the most surprising results for me. I had no idea that it was going to be so easy for the students to pick up these symbols. And I was very pleased with this. I was, I was ecstatic about this because I have a, a, a fondness for the APL symbols and Unicode symbols in general, um, as evidenced by my adding two more of them to the language. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this was, this was I, I'm, I'm quite happy with this, uh, that, that uh, at least when it came to actually getting anything done, the symbols were no problem. We still have to look at whether they felt like the symbols were a problem and whether there was a psychology there that maybe presented barriers. But when it came to them actually doing any work, there was zero negative impact. And furthermore, in every single class we had, we had at least one student working on every domain. So students were working on all the domains. We never had one domain that nobody was interested in. And this is interesting because if we had added more domains, would more students have picked up all of those domains? Is the distribution Certain, we haven't gotten exact distributions yet, but no domain was left out or left behind. And that, uh, that's also kind of interesting because that tells me that the, at least at some level, the students can be easily encouraged to look at different problem sets and will do that rather than having this sort of herd mentality of picking only one domain just because everyone else is doing it. Um, now, it's not quantitative, but it's, it's something. And another surprising result, there appeared to be zero problems with doing the parallel programming. Because we actually never told them that they were doing anything different than regular programming. We never told them that they were doing things that normal first year grad college students never do. But they had no problem with it, right? They wrote image blur animations, pure parallel, you know, all this, no problem. You know, they, they they did their tweaking on their simulations, their graphing calculated, all that, that and, and they were doing it parallel. None of them actually even tried to do an iterative approach. And part of that is how we, I think part of that is how we arrange the domains. Because we, we arrange the problems so that doing some problems would encourage a type of thinking that would help you solve larger problems 
um, using techniques that you had learned already, which were parallel. So we did do this encouraging a buildup of this. So we tried to get them moving this way, but there was no resistance against going this way, and that's, that's interesting. There was no, nobody who said, well, can't I just go over it over and over it again? Um, I think the closest we had was one of the existing programmers who um, knew Python or C++ or something who wanted to be able to put an if statement in. Um, and by and large, most of our problems didn't require if statements, but some of them would put an if statement in and use the defunds branching feature because it made them a little more comfortable than the full-on parallel. But that was about as close as we got. Most of them recognized that they didn't have to do loops to solve these problems. And, no, and most of them didn't even know that loops were a thing. Right? And this is, this is good. This, so I'm, I'm also quite happy with this. This is promising. Not conclusive, but very promising that, that we could potentially have a lot of ground to look at here. And there is some bad news. APL is kind of based on a math. It looks like math if you use just regular math symbols. Um, maybe there's a little trick here and there, but fundamentally, infix notation is something that students have been dealing with since their early years. That is, until they enter a computer science course room and start typing on a computer, in which case, they have no idea. What is this thing called math? <laughs> and so, as an example, I asked one of the students to solve an equation, which was, I think, x plus 2 equals y, and solve for x. And I use those terms, solve for x. That's a trigger word in algebra, right? You're supposed to go for that. And I put it up on the board, and they stared at it for about a minute. And then they continued to stare at it, Well, so, so rewrite it in terms of x equals y plus 2, or something like this. Basically, put the x on the side by itself. And, and they didn't even realize it was an equation, even though they had seen that equation so many times before. And we saw this when they were trying to type out expressions. I would say, well, add 2 to that thing. R write, uh, you know, do 2 plus this. And they would do something like this 2 plus, or plus this, this to close parenthesis, or something like this. So even though APL has a, almost no syntax, really, very, very, very little syntax, they were almost, a, a significant portion of them completely failed to transfer existing knowledge to, um, to the APL space that they already knew and were very comfortable with. And this is, this should be surprising, and it's not. Existing research clearly demonstrates that people have trouble transferring knowledge from one domain to another. This is, this is a well-known fact. I just wish it weren't so. But it was clearly borne out in our practices with the things that students actually struggled with, which I find kind of a bummer. So overall, this was a, a very surprising success. Um, and 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 it's surprising because everyone thought we were crazy. In fact, my other two colleagues thought we were crazy. The people who were learning this thought they were crazy. It wasn't until after the course was done that the instructors themselves said, hey, wow, this is actually kind of cool. I'm, I'm, this is, okay, I can buy this. But um, we had everybody from the top down and to the sides saying, this won't work, it's crazy. Um, nobody can do this, you're trying to too much, you've got too much content for them to learn, you have too much uh, material, you're dealing with an esoteric language that nobody's going to be able to figure out, why not use Python, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there was opposition everywhere to, to making this happen. Me being crazy, I went ahead anyway. Uh, and, and now we have some of these high school students still being regular participants in the computing groups at IU that are usually just the college students, but they're actually actively working on these areas, doing programming, then we had a huge amount, of, a very surprising amount of students go completely through their domains. And some of them finished them days in advance of, of the end of the course and wanted more domains to work on or started to work on their own things. They, they, there was not enough material for them to cover, not too little. And I, partly, I think that APL was, it was a little bit too... Uh, 
to thank for this because they solved rather complex problems that were uh, that that you would you wouldn't encounter maybe until your second semester in in your computer science courses or or later, uh, and and they actually had fun doing it. They, there was a, a few students were kind of ah, eh, this isn't what I expected, blah, 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 you know, but most of the students were quite happy to to work in this um, space and behaved kind of like computer scientists, which was nice to see. And they did all this with having almost no scaffolding. We, d all, we gave them almost no, co occasionally we gave them a helper function that they didn't have to understand or go through, they just used it. But that was using a library that we gave them. We gave them some of this stuff, but they wrote and solved the problems on their own without us giving them the code. They wrote all this code themselves. They figured out how to write the code and then made it work and got it to do what it should with our help, but without us actually writing any of that code for them or telling them what to write. And some example problems of the things that they solved in this course, over two weeks, uh, six courses, probably for a total of about 12 total programming hours. We had them doing fractals, which they completed easily, probably on day one or two. Um, we had them doing uh, an animation where you blur an image, fade it out into black or whatever it was. We had them doing mapping and plotting trajectories of the cannonballs where they had to actually implement the graphing calculator. Um, they had to uh, learn how to draw axes on the lines and the origins, scale, um, scale functions, graph the functions and how they worked, and, and manage all of that. All we gave them was a canvas that they could draw on. And, uh, you know, taking the game of life function and colorizing it, doing different colors, different weights. We had people doing different numbers, working on non-Boolean games of life uh, and playing with that. We had one person who said, I don't want to do all this. I want to write a game engine. So we went through and we, we uh, demonstrated going through games. We, did, we played around with uh, implementing a roguelike implementation of games. We did most of the students in the image manipulation domain did all their image manipulations and then started making their own image manipulations and, and using ex images that they had grabbed from other places and, and writing their own stuff that we hadn't actually told them to do. And this leads me to consider that perhaps, just maybe, parallel programming has been mistaught or misrepresented just a little bit. Um, because if a high schooler can get it, well, why are we having so much trouble with it? Um, and I think APL allowed us to expose these students to a huge variety of concepts in computer science. They were doing reductions, higher order programming, mapping, folding, uh, multi-dimensional arrays, different domains of integers and data types, uh, um, uh, function abstraction, all of this stuff in only two weeks, rather than you know, two semesters or three semesters worth of work to get there. And we were intentionally shallow in our exposure, but we, we we covered a lot of stuff, and they got an exposure to a variety of things, and they weren't upset that that was happening. And I think that's, that's fairly good. So we have a lot of future work to do. Um, can we use a different language and use similar concepts and teach the same thing? Or is the APL syntax particularly conducive to this? We don't know. It'd be nice to know. Um, if we wanted to make a longer course, like a full semester's worth of a course, does this technique scale up to that? Because uh, it's a lot of work for two weeks. Um, uh, an amazing amount of work to get this done. But it seemed to be good for two weeks. Can we make it happen for a longer course? Um, do we have, you know, can we run this again and get, try to focus in on some particular quantitative results rather than qualitative exploration? Can we, can we transition students into a traditional program, teach them the more traditional things after they've learned all this? Can they pick that stuff up? Is it as easy to pick up as when you first start with that? Or is it like the, the flip of, of doing parallelism after you've done iterative? Will they find iterative more difficult after having done parallelism? Um, and we have, I think, many, many, many hours of recorded sessions of them typing on their computers and what they were doing, the problems they were solving, and the kind of errors and troubles they had. And we want to analyze this and try to figure out uh, patterns in what was happening. But we have yet to do that. So that's the whirlwind tour of the program. And I'm happy to take questions. I think we have time. So I, 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 I encourage anybody to ask anything they really want to know about this, because I, I find this a very exciting possibility in terms of how we can approach 
teaching and exposing people to this sort of language and other things. The next time you do this, I want you to enroll four or five of your faculty from computer oh. science in the oh. course. Oh dear. Uh, they have yet to see the results. Um, the, the problem with the faculty is some of the faculty are old enough to have used APL in the past. And the problem is they have this idea that APL consists largely of integers and this funny go-to statement. And uh, they sort of skip everything else. So uh, I don't know how much you can teach an old dog new tricks on that one. Uh, no. I want to share a story with you, my personal, you know. So I have two children, and my older daughter is in 11th grade now. In 9th grade, I, I was hoping to introduce my, ch my older child to programming. So I kind of forced her to take introduction to programming. Uh -huh. And I was hoping to help her, uh, being a programmer myself. And I was thinking that maybe they'll teach Java or C or Python or something like that. Turns out they have uh, an environment called Alice. Yes, which is now uh, turned into a little bit of a thing called Scratch and some other And I, I think it's the worst possible idea of how to introduce somebody to programming. Ah. Because they learned nothing about programming. They solved no problems. Um, they were completely turned off. And if I mention the word programming now or, or computer or anything like that, my child leaves the room. So I have absolutely no possibility You've of ever roping. Yeah. I've lost a chance, yeah. yes. So, so uh, there's, there are two ways of looking at Scratch. And I think um, one of them is the positive way. Scratch has been shown to be very, very good at getting certain people very excited about potentially doing things with computers. But there is no, there's no, um, there's no scalability to the thing, which is part of the reason why I went for this study. Because if you start young enough with Scratch, they can get excited about it, forget what it was like to use it, and then go for a real programming language, because they just remember the warm and fuzzies. And they move from there. As that kind of a tool, I think it has a lot of potential, and I think the research has shown that it has a lot of potential. But if you're trying to teach computer science using Scratch, you can't move up out of Scratch. You get a lot of bad stuff going on. Yes, yes. They just drag and drop pictures together, and that makes things go. But it's working with the computer, and you make things happen. And so if you get them young enough, that's cool. So actually, it was suggested as a joke, but I think it would be really interesting to see if you did the same thing with advancing ages and see what you find through the different age groups. Yes, yes, I think so. I think um, there has been a study, I haven't read it myself, somebody told me about it, that they took adults and had them describe how they would solve a particular problem and tell somebody else to solve that problem. And I think what they discovered at this was there a lot, was a lot of concurrency, a lot of parallelism, and a lot of, uh, or a, a lack of termination conditions, and, a, and people would invent computing constructs, but they were computing constructs that weren't the traditional ones. So one-armed if was invented, two-armed if never invented, um, and these sorts of things. And, and actually, that sort of maps kind of closely to defunds. So, yeah, no, but I think it would be very interesting to pursue that if I could make enough time for that. Uh, maybe post graduate work. Yeah. Uh, you asked, uh, or you were saying, oh, future work, can we use other languages to do this? Okay, so now you're going to teach them how to do parallel programming, and your, the language is C. No. The world is, you know, <laughs> there's not enough time. Wh wh what, 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 what language would you pick? When I say other languages, uh, we had originally intended to do this with Racket. Uh, Racket is a language that has existing um, um, market penetration in the educational sphere, and it's a functional language, sort of like Scheme. It's a scheme. But there's a lot of libraries for expressing array operations. So there's like an array library. And so you can kind of get this. And I think you can get, if you start with arrays and then put enough library around it to make it look like this, you've got the exact same semantic model with a different veneer over the top. Now, does that veneer matter at all? That's a question that a lot of people talk about, but there's not a lot of evidence that the veneer matters or doesn't matter. So something like this is ideal for testing that out if we, can, if we can continue forward. Because we're using the same semantic platform, but with a different syntax. And we can identify how much of a difference that makes. Yeah. Uh, 
Any other questions? Right, I have um, one observation about this scratch thing. I think the biggest problem with putting these kind of things into the schools or why it got there is because that generation of teachers are very uncomfortable with computers. So I think with a new generation of teachers that are a little more computer educated, it might be easier to get real training into the schools. Now, that said, with APL, you program at the level of your own thought process. Ideally. It's a tool of thought, yeah? Ideally speaking. No, but real computer science, quote, unquote, actually forces you to decompose beyond your own level of thinking to accommodate the computer's way of thinking. I, I disagree with that, actually. Okay. Um, I think that was the question. Yeah. I, <laughs> Uh, computer science is moving in a couple of directions. Traditional computer science was a lot about um, how do we make something work correctly on this limited machine that we have. Most people in most curriculums nowadays in computer science don't take that approach. Problem decomposition is still critically important. Abstractions and building abstractions are still critically important. But the, the bit twiddling has become much less important. And what's become more important is how can we describe problems in ways that are friendly to our modern computers, which requires parallelism. And so there is a strong movement to try to figure out how to teach parallelism to people. Um, and so far, they've been able to get it not very far. Graduate students learn parallelism. Undergrads mostly don't. They can get functional programming, and that helps a little bit. Uh, but, but I think, it, it, like you were saying, the old guard, if, as, as they move out, the, the idea that we need to have a way of reasoning about parallel programs for computer scientists, that they need to be able to write parallel friendly programs to start with, rather than doing all this effort to, trans, uh, to convert a, a serial program into a parallel program, that I think uh, will become much more popular over time and, and, and that will feed even more support into this sort of approach where we're, we're trying to make sure that people think in ways that are friendly to our modern computers, rather than thinking in ways that are friendly to the traditional mainframe computers or something like this. Uh, or at least that's, that's my opinion. I, we'll, we'll see. Time will tell. Time will tell. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.